You're listening to the Packernet Podcast Network. I'm Alex Rodriguez. And I'm Jason Kelly. From Bloomberg, this is The Deal. Each week, you will hear us in conversation with business icons. This show will explore deal-making across sports, media, and entertainment. That is a harsh lesson in business. Sports is not and, as um, simple you know, I, as bringing a bunch of big names together. I didn't want to do another stomp you out speech. It opened so, up so many you know, more doors. The show is called The, the deal. deal. Listen to The Deal. Listen to The Deal on Spotify. All right. What's up, guys? Welcome to Packers Total Access. My name is Clayton Bailey. You can check us out on Packernet.com. You can find me on Twitter at Packers underscore access. If you'd like to email the show, you can send a message to Packers Total Access at gmail.com. And uh, we've got a pretty cool show set up for you guys today. We've actually got a special guest on the line with us, and he's on the road. We're hoping that things stay somewhat clear. I know sometimes service can get choppy uh, when we're doing these uh, these mobile calls like this. So uh, hopefully everything will We'll stay in tune here, but we've got Justin from the Packer net and um, guys, this dude wears so many hats. He's our graphics guy. So any awesome graphics you see hit Twitter, this dude was behind. He was the mastermind behind that. He's also one third of the Packer net fantasy podcast. Um, dude's married. He's got 32 children to the best of my knowledge. And um, he also plays bass for the Oak Ridge boys. Is all that correct there? Uh, Justin? <laughs> uh, I mean, I mean, head, I, I actually play guitar, not bass, and my band name's a little bit different, but I do have 30, and uh, I do quite a bit for Packernet. No, I'm just kidding. I, I do have four kids, but. Awesome. Good stuff, man. Well, we appreciate it. We know you're very, very busy, man, and I'm excited to have you on the show. I've been following along with the Fantasy Podcast, and everybody knows who listens to my show. I'm not a huge fantasy guy, but I just love the chemistry that you three have, man. It's just like you're hanging out, drinking a cold beer, talking ball with the boys, and uh, I'm all about it. I, it's it's absolutely awesome. So um, as we get into the show here, guys, this is going to be kind of just a, just a chill session, man. We're just going to kind of hang out and talk a little Packers, talk a little Bears, and we've already done our, uh, our game plan for the Bears game, right? Kind of gave you a, a coach's uh, look at okay how how they may be looking to attack the Chicago Bears. We also did a chalk talk earlier in the week, and of course we've got the uh, Packers Total Access post game show with Jacob tomorrow immediately following the game. It's going to be three a.m. before I get in the bed, Justin. But I'm excited about having some Packers football on Sunday night football for sure. Um, but before we get into it, I do want to give a shout out. We've got a new Patreon. His name's Justin Connor. Justin, we really really appreciate you taking the time to support the show, man. And if anybody does want to support the show through Patreon, you can do that by sending or by connecting on uh, patreon.com forward slash Clayton Bailey, C-L-A-Y-T-O-N-B-A-I-L-E-Y. And um, there's no tiers set up. There's there's no, uh, you know, there's no amount too small if you want to contribute to the show. There's no amount too large. I wanted to leave that open because everybody's got different budgets and everybody kind of contributes in different ways. So, um, whatever uh, someone wants to donate is totally cool with me. But what we are allowing is uh, some extra perks. If someone does join Patreon, we'll be kind of, um, you know, allowing them to steer the ship a little bit. And that'll happen here a little later in the show, which I'm excited about as well. So let's go to the first thing. We had a listener um, actually email the show, Justin. And uh, this came from Bill Ryan. And Bill Ryan said, Hi, Clayton. Just came across the disturbing video of David Bakhtiari almost two years after the injury, and he's still limping. At this point, I believe his career is over. Um, please send this over to Ryan too. Thanks. So this came in from Bill Ryan and that very video I tweeted out and man, what a, what a weird response I got, Justin, on Twitter. I'm just, I'm going to try to keep this positive, but it, you know, it got a ton of likes and I think the large, large, large majority, you know, realized why I sent the tweet out. It was basically a tweet going like, look at what this dude's going through, man. He is out there battling day in and day out. And you could tell the guy's in pain. You can tell he's fought through multiple surgeries already. 
already sacrificed so much for the organization. And in the tweet, all I said was, if this isn't doable, man, you got nothing to be ashamed about. Walk away and and enjoy your life, man. You you gave it your all if this isn't doable, but I want to see him back. Now, it sounds like, um, you know, the organization, Justin, they're kind of downplaying this, right? Um, but I wanted to kind of get your take on it, man, because first of all, there were some people that hit me up in the mentions, which I know there's always going to be people that want to stir crap, but there was just two or three that was like, you need to delete this. It's it's wrong to tag somebody and tell them to retire. And I'm, I had to walk them back through like they were in third grade. Just I'm like, dude, I didn't say I didn't tell them to retire in the tweet. I was thanking him for fighting through an injury. But if you want to be a moron, be a moron. But anyway, what do you think about David Bakhtiari? Dude? Do you think he's healthy now? Do you think he's uh, he's going to be healthy moving forward or do you think that that video that surfaced, you know, is uh, is something that that, you know, it, it, I don't see how it could be a positive. But what's your let me get a filler from you on David Bakhtiari. I think, sadly, a lot of the fan base has kind of uh, shut him down, kind of just he's not going to come back. Um, I know, like you said, the floor went up to the podium and he sort of down, said that he's fine. Um but you know they they've been downplaying that since he since all not ready this year. Um, personally, I'm gonna say I'm I'm optimistic that he does come. I don't really think I could even even guess a timeline on that. Um, obviously, seeing him limping around isn't the, the greatest thing you want to see. But you know we're talking about a guy that he gave us a lot of. He's an All Pro left tackle. He's you know probably the best lineman we've had in who knows how long seems to be in good spirit it's, you know you always see him and rogers goofing off and stuff and <laughs> having a yeah they're, they're they're a blast to watch on that on, on that golf cart man but oh. i don't i don't know i i would hope he would come back sooner than later but we never really know yeah i'm with you man and you know the goal of the tweet wasn't to try to predict anything. And I think that's what people get so upset about is they're they're Everybody's looking for a hot take. They're looking for something to go. Yeah, I told you so. Or they're looking for something to argue, you know, about. But um, for me, man, it's just you got to you got to show appreciation where it's due. And, and the guy, like I said, you know, he's been an overachiever his entire career and he's laid it all on the line time and time and time again. And um the fact that it's been two years now is just, it's hard because it, you know, it, it's, it's amazing how on social media you see fans and they're like, oh, I thought he was supposed to be healthy by now. And they, you know, they get so tore up over it. And it's like, there's nobody more frustrated than David Bakhtiari. I promise you that. And they, they talk about rehabbing an ACL, forget the other structural damage that, that took, that had taken place, you know, and, and required other multiple surgeries. But just an ACL alone, you've got to retrain your body, your, your mind to accept that invasive procedure on your knee to say, no, this no, this is a part of us. Now we have to retrain it to be able to walk and, and kind of uh, adjust to everything else that goes into the human anatomy. You know, obviously you hear my accent. I'm not a doctor. I'm the farthest thing from it. Right. But uh you know, we come from a, a few doctors in the family brewing moonshine over the years back home in Kentucky, but other than that, <laughs> that's about it. But I just, I want the dude to be healthy, but I want him to be happy. You know, I, I don't, I don't want him to feel like, you know, I, he's letting anyone down. Right. And uh, that was the whole goal was, Hey man, let's as fans, let's reach out to him and let him know, dude, we see what you're doing. We see the pain you're in and we appreciate it. That type of thing. So um, something else that was tweeted out was by Matt Schneib and it said, all 53 players on the active roster are practicing for the Packers. That includes John Runyon Jr., who's still in concussion protocol, but has reached the stage of where he can practice. So I felt like that was a good sign, too. You know, I, I think John Runyon's one of those offensive linemen, man. He's I've got this love-hate, you know, uh, fanship with, I guess you could say. Um, you know, he's a great pass blocker, but his run grade is always low on PFF. But when you see Jake Hansen play guard, it's really, really hard to – to accept him playing anywhere on the offensive line. So you talk about the guard opposite him going down um, kind of solidifies Jake Hansen's spot if indeed Runyon isn't healthy. But it sounds like things are kind of trending up there. Um, what do you? What kind of role do you think that could play in this offensive line, especially here against the Bears, if John Runyon can't play in the game? You know, are we going to see Zach Tom? How do you how do you see the offensive line in that regard? Yeah. So I know. Oh, uh, PFF and then 
some of you, but I thought uh, I thought Zach Tom looked pretty good in the game from my perspective. Uh, uh, I would really I would really like to see a replacement for Jake Hansen. I watching him like you ever you ever see them kids that ride around on them little hoverboards? Yeah. He was on one of them, and Zadarius was pushing him back. Backwards. <laughs> he he was just on skates the whole time, and and I obviously we're dealing with like a a patchwork offense. Everybody thinks we're we're completely doomed if we don't get Bach and Jenkins back soon. Um, I agree with that. I think I think we have some good pieces on the line. And I just uh, I hope hopefully those guys. But until then, at least at least this week, I don't. Think we're going to face anything nearly as tough for comp the Vikings? So they don't have they don't have Zadarius Smith. They don't have a Daniel Hunter. They don't have guys that are and athletic. I think uh, I think we'll be all right for this week for sure. I'm I'm pretty up. Op- yeah, yeah. You know, it, any given Sunday, I know anything can happen. But if there was going to be a week that that we had to deal with. Uh, an injured offensive line just one more week. It would be against the Bears at Lambeau. If it was in Chicago, I may even be a little more concerned. But the fact that it's at home in Lambeau, um, we'll have to deal with the crowd noise that they did in Minnesota. That's another thing too, man. You know, when you talk about that offensive sh- offense struggling in uh, in Minnesota, you know, they were playing from behind the entire game, right? And um, when you're playing from behind and that crowd's loud and you're being forced, I don't think they were forced to pass the ball as much as they they, you know, did pass the ball. However, I'm not in the meeting rooms. I'm not watching the all 22 in real time, you know, and trying to determine, okay, why are they not running the ball here? Um, when you look at the, when you look at the replay as a whole, it's like, yeah, man, you guys should not have gotten that far away from the running game that quick, but man, there's so many moving parts on that offensive line, which it kind of led me, Justin, to think, okay, if you ask any offensive lineman across the league, would you rather run block or pass block? I mean, 99% of the time they say, oh, absolutely run block. I mean, it's it's the it, you get to be aggressive and you don't have to make yourself vulnerable to chips and things like that. And and you're just kind of constantly on your heels reacting to the defender, to the pass rusher. So um, I, I kind of feel like a running game would have helped him a little bit more, but at the same time not being healthy, I mean, it is what it is. You do what you got to do. Um, one of the things that came out, a tweet from Tom Silverstein said also, and we're going to talk about the injury report here in just a second, but he said also the Peck injury was removed from Elton Jenkins' injury status this week, another sign he's getting close. So the fact that that was completely moved, you know, the Peck injury, the reason that he had that brace on that that happened there uh, late in training camp, um, that coming off and now he was full participation on Friday is a great sign that Elton comes back. And and I kind of see – I know a couple of us in the Discord chat with Packernet, Justin, that um, a couple guys disagreed on where they should play Elton. Me personally, I think Yash has played great at left tackle. Every time he's been called on, he's done the job. I mean, he literally held his own against uh, Bosa from San Francisco last year and then comes out last week. I believe he was our highest-graded offensive lineman last week. Keep him at left tackle. I say you take um, – I say you take uh, Elton Jenkins, put him in at right tackle, and then obviously put Royce Newman back to right guard. Hansen comes out of the lineup. If Runyon is good to go, you're good there. You got Myers at center. I'm not saying it's the ideal scenario with David Bakhtiari still being out, but I feel like that would be a lot years ahead of what we had there last week in Minnesota. But where do you see Elton Jenkins as far as this offensive line? Do you feel like um, they should play him at his original left guard spot? Should they play him at right tackle? I'm pretty sure your answer is going to be whatever you got to do to get hands out of the lineup. But how do you uh, see that? What, what do you want to see out in that? Yeah, I mean you're not too far off with whatever you got to do to get. Uh, generally, I think he he's an all, all pro level guard. But for our unfortunate situation right now, like I said, with that kind of patchwork line, and he we're the best guy we have. So at that point, I'm going to agree with you. I'd say. With how oh, Yash is him at the left tackle, and then I would say you probably put Jenkins at the right tackle, just because, just because I think that it's a, a more more important position, and I think that he would he would do best there, like a suitable anywhere around the line. He's, he's he's a good lineman no matter where you put him. With the, with his verse situation, you're you're definitely gonna once he comes back, if 
Bakhtiari isn't back at that point, which I don't right tackle. Yeah, definitely. I agree there for sure. And Zach Tom, and I'm excited about the future for Zach Tom, but I don't think he's there yet. I really don't. I, I hear a lot of people on Twitter saying, you got to start Zach Tom and, and a lot of the beat riders, you know, you got to start Zach Tom. I don't understand why they're not playing Zach Tom. He's obviously the best. And I just, I don't understand how they came to that conclusion because the reason I was excited about Zach Tom was the coaches seem to be pretty high on him. Okay. Well, if the coach's opinion carries that much weight with me or anyone else, then why all of a sudden, why, why all of a sudden do we think he should be a starter when the coaches obviously think he should probably be a backup at this stage? Now, Matt LaFleur did say there's definitely a chance that he becomes a starter, right? Um, and that's great and everything, but um, the PFF grade suggests he's not quite there yet. But, uh, that again, the PFF grade isn't everything, but I feel like it's a lot better than just Joe Schmo on Twitter saying that he thinks Zach Tom is one of the better offensive linemen, you know, but again, though, the, that the media, they, they crack me up, man. I don't want to turn this into a bash fest, but I heard the other day on a post game show, I was listening to uh, there on Monday morning. And one of the media guys said, yeah, this defense really struggled against Minnesota. And, and we've heard all camp long that they're a top five defense. And I, I about choked. I was like, you're the one at practice. You're the only people who have been saying this is going to be a top five defense. Like you're the ones reporting that they dominated training camp. And then they come back and say, all we have heard, who told you, who, who, who told you that? Because you were the one telling us that because we know the coaches didn't say it. We know the players weren't saying, Oh, we're going to be a top five defense. It just cracks me up how the media spins that. And all of a sudden it turns into, we've been here and, <laughs> and one of them actually cut the other one off and said, well, yeah, I mean, we we actually did report that. You know, it was us that was saying, and I'm like, yeah, <laughs> I about lost my crap. But moving on to the injury report, um, here's the full injury report, and, and you can cut me off at any point if there's something you want to talk about, but I can kind of go through it real quick, and we can touch on a few things here. And one is definitely Alan Lazard that I want to kind of hit on. But um, David Bakhtiari, limited participation. He's questionable is his Friday status. Uh, You know, I haven't seen anything uh, come through as far as updates on Saturday here yet. Jake Hansen, full participation. I know you're disappointed about that. (laughs) Elton Jenkins, full participation. Uh, Alan Lazard, limited uh, participation, and he is questionable. So is Elton Jenkins. Even though Elton was full participation, he's still listed as questionable. Like I said, Alan Lazard, listed as questionable. Mercedes Lewis, full participation, of course. Keyshawn Nixon, full participation. That's great news. John Runyon, limited participation, but the fact that he practiced is typically a sign that he is now clearing concussion protocol or he would still be completely out to the best of my knowledge. Then we got Quay Walker, full yeah. participation. So as far as the injury report there, let me ask you about Alan Lazard. Um, it's saying he's limited, but I know he did practice way more this week than he did last week, which, which suggests that he will be playing here against the Bears. Um, how important do you think it is that Alan Lazard plays in this game against Chicago? I mean, do you do you push him back because you want him back in the lineup, or do you go, you know what, it's not that big of a deal, let's hold him out another week? How do you see that playing out there with, with Alan Lazard, and what would you like to see play it out, I guess? Uh, I, I definitely like that, that Rodgers obviously views him as the, the number one wide receiver, and, you know, he probably is our most tra- – when he's back, back, I think Rodgers might relax a little bit bit more and look look to him kind of how he did you know um i think i think that he is gonna probably give dobbs and watson chances i think that i think this is kind of the game that that christian watson's gonna gonna fit and come back from that drop like we've talked about all week every everyone is holding watson should be held accountable for it but it, it was one drop man receivers are dropping the ball all across the league. so i think I think he, he's going to get his opportunities, and he's he's the guy I'm looking to actually flash in this, this game. I think back would would probably help that even more, free free him up a little bit, have Christian Watson, and and then like I said, have have, have Lazard as kind of that X where he's just kind of all over and open. If, if you look at the injury report you just you just brought up, I kind of look at it injured. You got Bach, Jenkins, Lazard. Quay and Runyon in in the concussion, how those protocols work. You, you, you generally don't expect someone with a concussion. So I highly doubt that he plays on Sunday. I don't see David Bakhtiari coming. But the other three, I 
I do see a possibility that they all come back. Jenkins, maybe because we don't, don't know, but I, I really don't see any reason that they leave Lazard out of this game. And it sounds like it was not as serious as it seemed, which is which is super encouraging news because that dude was flying pressing, in my opinion. Yeah, I agree completely. Yeah, and on the Bears' side of the ball, or side of the field, I should say, you got Kari Blassengame, I think is how you say his name, a backup running back. He's full, full participation. Bayless Jones, Jr., wide receiver, um, had a hamstring issue. He did not participate, and he is doubtful. So they're going to be down a receiver there with the rookie. Um, I believe he's a rookie, if I remember right. Bayless Jones, maybe he's not. No, I, I can't remember. Anyway, yeah, Riley Reed. is. Gotcha. Okay, cool. I, I knew he was young. Uh, Riley Reef, offensive lineman, got a shoulder injury. He was full participation. So looks like they're going to be down Bayless Jones Jr. Other than that, they're pretty healthy, um, which, I mean, a healthy Bears team with the way this roster is built is probably worse than, uh, um, you know, most injured <laughs> teams across the league. Um, again, though, I do want to preface, though, man, that any given Sunday, you know, any given Sunday, anything can happen. Um, I just want to see the, Bear, uh, the Packers come out. And absolutely boat race the Bears, though, for sure. So, um, yeah, so as we wrap up that injury report segment there, is there anything else you want to hit on before we actually get into a, uh, a listener email or a listener Patreon message? Is there anything you want to touch on there with the injury report? I think I, I pretty much said everything I wanted to say there. Um, I say move, move right along. All right, awesome. What we're going to do, guys, is going to take a quick commercial break. But first, I want to mention that today's show is brought to you by PristineAuction.com. Pristine's the most trusted sports memorabilia auction site with an A-plus Better Business Bureau rating. All of our listeners actually have a chance to win a mini Vince Lombardi trophy signed by Jordy Nelson. It is sweet. You can go check that out online. All you got to do is head over to PristineAuction.com, click register on the top of the page. It's absolutely free, guys. This is free 99. You're not going to get it any cheaper anywhere else, okay? Go click at register at the top of the page. When you register, use our registration code FARB, F-A-B-R-E, and that'll enter you into the contest. As a bonus, Pristine Auction will kick in $10 off your first winning auction. So you know, something that, like I said, it's free to put your name in the hat to win a win that you know free uh, mini Lombo of, uh, autographed by Jordy Nelson. But also, if you do see something on the site you want to purchase, $10 off your first winning auction, which is really cool. Uh, every item on pristineauction.com comes with a certificate of authenticity from the industry's most reputable authenticators. And that drawing is actually going to be held Monday, September the 19th. So just a couple more days, guys. Get it in today. Get it in tomorrow. And um, like I said, man, uh, you know, this is something. This is our second round with this. We we actually gave away a free Quay Walker jersey not too long ago. Guy emailed us. We actually read it over the show. Really, really cool story there. It was autographed. Walker jersey. Um, all he did was went, click register, signed up. Lo and behold, he had it shipped right to his uh, front door, got a uh, an autographed Quay jersey. So pretty cool stuff. Make sure you go enter yourself into that. Now, let's take us a quick commercial break, pay a few bills, and we'll be right back to, uh, to talk Chicago Bears, Matt LaFleur, and uh, wrap this thing up with Justin. I want to tell you guys real quick about our new sponsor, Factor. Factor makes delicious, ready-to-eat meals, and they get sent right to your door. They have 35 different options every single week that you can choose from, including keto, calorie smart, vegan and veggie, and more. And there's even more to enjoy with over 55 nutrition-packed add-ons that help make your weekly meal planning even more delicious. There's no prep work. There's no messing up six different bowls, mixing stuff. Factor meals are 100% ready to heat and eat. No prep, no cook, no cleanup. Factor is also very flexible with your schedule. You can get as much or as little as you need by choosing between 6 to 18 meals per week. You can also pause or reschedule your deliveries anytime. Factor is less expensive than takeout, and every meal is dietitian approved. So head to factormeals.com slash packdaddy50 and use code packdaddy50 to get 50% off. That's code packdaddy50 at factormeals.com slash packdaddy50 to get 50% off. Hey, U.S. Cellular customers, I've got good news, so don't hit skip forward just yet. I'm talking about their special customer event, Us Days. What's Us Days? It means exclusive offers just for their customers, just to say thanks, like up to $1,200 to upgrade to any new phone. No, I didn't just misread that. That's up to $1,200 off. They must really like you. Us Days at U.S. Cellular, exclusive offers just for you, just to say thanks. Right now, U.S. Cellular customers get up to $1,200 to upgrade to any new phone. Terms apply. 
I'm Alex Rodriguez. And I'm Jason Kelly. From Bloomberg, this is The Deal. Each week, you're here in conversation with business icons. This show will explore deal making across sports, media, and entertainment. That is a harsh lesson in business. Sports is and not and, as uh, simple you know, as bringing a bunch of big names together. I didn't want to do another stomp you out speech. It opened so, up so many you know, more doors. The show is called The, the deal. deal. Listen to The Deal. Listen to The Deal on Spotify. Survivor 46 is here and so is On Fire, the only official Survivor podcast. And we have a twist this season. The winner of Survivor 45, D. Valladares, will be joining us every week. We're going behind the scenes of the biggest moments, the how and the why things happen, and the strategy and analysis you can only get from someone like me, a Survivor winner. Listen to On Fire, the official Survivor podcast, wherever you get your podcast. All right, we're back. So, Justin, I actually had in my Patreon group uh, had a message came come across, and this come from uh, our, our buddy Brian uh, Brian uh, Piahovich, and he said, first of all, amazing pronunciation of my last name. <laughs> no one ever gets it on the first try. It's funny the redneck got it on the first try, right? Um, I you know I, I read on a third grade level, but somehow I get the names right. That's funny. Um, I'm not sure how to research it but I want to get your opinion on Matt LaFleur's coaching slash management. It just seems odd that he's such a dominant, has such a dominant record, but his losses are bad. Inferior teams. The Packers not showing up the ever popular quote. We got away from the run and that's my fault comments and his pressers. Why do they quote, get away from the game plan so easily in these losses? Uh, is he a good practice manager and solid in preparations, but not so good in game? Maybe I'm being overcritical, and I hope that I am, but that's why I'm asking you. Lots to unpack here, so I'm not sure you can get to all of it by tomorrow, but it's been on my mind for a while, and I'm very confused about the Jekyll and Hyde of this team's in wins versus losses. So um, I'll go first here, and then I'll turn it over to you, Justin. You know, you've heard people talk about how Matt LaFleur is a grinder, right? And uh, I'm not talking about on the dance floor either, all right? I'm talking <laughs> talking about <laughs> preparation for the upcoming game, you know, uh, Aaron Rodgers has praised it time and time again. It just talks about how Matt's always in the office. Matt's always uh, scheming. He's always just just working to give his team an advantage. And, and I think that that really, really comes into play when there's a lot of information on the table. Now, when you talk about him losing the first two games, of the, the first game of the season two years in a row, that really plays into the fact that he is, he is very, very good at preparing for teams because when you go into a new season – you know, we all hear about it all the time that, you know, all veterans don't need off season. Yeah, they do, because it's a whole new system every year. I mean, they're they're looking to install different things that they didn't get to the year before, things that they noticed throughout the year that they can add a wrinkle here or there. So essentially, when you go into week one, and it's why I said the other day, Justin, you don't catch me gambling on week one because anything can happen. Because you don't know what these teams are going to do. You know, when they played the Saints last year and got boat raced, right? It, they, it's hard to prepare for that. Yeah, you can look at the tape from the year before, but the personnel, you know, the, the players on the roster is a little bit different. The coaching staff gets shifted and adjusted a little bit. Plus, you've got your self-scouting system where these coaches are going back to previous year and they're going, okay, what do we do good? What do we do bad? Where were we predictable? Where were we unpredictable? And let's adjust. So when you've got a coach – that his strength is preparing for the upcoming opponent. And then all of a sudden you, you know, you prepare heavily for one thing and they come out and do something else. That's a totally different ball game. Right. And uh, that's one of the things that I think happened on Sunday with Minnesota as well. So that would be my quick answer to this. And, and like he said here in the message, probably ain't even got enough time to, uh, to go too much of a deep dive, but I kind of feel like that's, you know, the reason that Matt LaFleur has never lost a game too, after, you know, coming off a loss. He's never lost two games in a row, right? Um, regular season games, I should say. And I think the reason is because he is so well prepared. I guarantee you, he looked at the tape from Chicago last week and, you know, he's okay. He's got a good idea what they're going to try to do. But this is the thing that that makes me step back and go, okay, guys, maybe this isn't going to be the nine and a half point favorite, you know, Green Bay Packer game that Vegas is calling for because both teams didn't get to do a lot of what they wanted to do last week in that monsoon. I mean, I don't know if you've seen the videos, Justin, but there was water standing everywhere on the field. And it, it cracks me up that people look at that and they go, oh, it ain't a big deal. 
okay, you can say it's not a big deal, but I pull a butt cheek when I reach off the couch to grab the remote, and all of a sudden we're pretending like these guys can play great football when there's puddles of water every, everywhere on the field. I don't know. I kind of I'm a little hesitant because of the fact that they probably didn't show everything they're going to do. But at the same time, Matt LaFleur coming into this game does really good coming off of losses because of that preparation aspect that Aaron Rodgers and everybody else mentioned. Um, but what do you think it is about Matt LaFleur, Justin, that that he just struggles in in the big playoff games? But also um, sometimes when you're you know, it, it's funny, we're talking about both. Right. We're talking about great playoff games. He struggles, uh, great playoff teams. He struggles against those. But then also, um, you know, you've got a, a crappy team that, that people think that they should beat. I'm not saying Minnesota was that, but that's kind of what the, the listener alluded to here. What do you think it is about Matt LaFleur, man? Well, to start off with, you said something about week one being uh, – you you and I were, were talking back and forth through text messages about what bets to make, and you said that – you told me just go ahead and leave, leave week one alone because it's kind of – and. Being me not, not listening, I went and made bets anyways, and you were right. I, I didn't was all over the place, and and that's just it. That you know, we yeah, we we lost. The floor came in with a bad game plan, but you know it's week one, and la- last year week one was a lot worse than. It's hard to discredit a coach like him, though, man. He three years in a row, the dude has won thirteen. Got we haven't made it all the way to we haven't made it all the way to the Super Bowl, but. But he, he's a worker. You can tell he's he's an intelligent coach. Um, part of me on the whole big game losses thing is, is and and this is not me discrediting. I really do believe, believe that that he, he is the the most talented quarterback ever to play the position. Um, but I think that that Rodgers tends to to he we all know when things are going wrong he kind of gets in that like pouty pouty mood and, and I think that that on to the rest of the team when he gets in as soon as he gets in that mood it's like unless he he, he never gets out of it and you, and I think that 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 bad mood carries us isn't I also don't know and nobody does know you know does like last week was that a LaFleur thing or was that Rogers trying to make up things at the beginning of the game I and mean, he's he's changing these runs to passes you know we we don't don't know um and, and like i said maybe we won't ever know but I, I i tend to i tend to believe that a lot of those big losses are rogers than they are the floor that's just me yeah no i i think you make a great point and and not only does rogers have the freedom to change the play but there's also a lot of alerts and rpo aspects of this offense right and Here's the other thing, too. You know, the other team gets paid, too, right? <laughs> like, we coming into the season, I picked Minnesota as a loss on the road, and I picked the Packers to beat them at home. And I'll be honest with you, I kind of struggled a little bit with the home, uh, picking them to win at the home, at home at Lambeau. And the reason being is because this is a, this is a team. It's not a bad team. It's a pretty so- – some people would argue it's a stronger roster than the Green Bay Packers. It's just the fact that you've got – you know, arguably the best quarterback to ever play the game at that key position, you know, makes a makes a huge, huge, you know, factor, you know, uh, in, into determining that. But, um, yeah, you know, the RPO aspect as well as, like you said, with Aaron Rodgers, um, I don't know how much of it's Aaron, how much of it's LaFleur. I would say the majority of it is Aaron and him changing the plays and, and getting into what, what he thinks is the right play, but at the same time, and I'm not saying you're doing this, Justin, but, you know, we don't complain when they win 13 games and he wins back-to-back MVPs. But when we lose, it's, what is he doing? Up <laughs> you know, yeah, what have right. you done for me lately? We're all guilty of that. I know I am anyway. And it's just funny, too, because watching that game, man, um, I, I just remember sitting there thinking, and I would make comments every now and then, and as soon as I made the comment, Immediately, I was like, you don't really feel that way. Why did you even say that? Because I was getting frustrated. Like when when Rogers mouthed that toward the sideline, too, you know, in the in the moment, I wanted to punch the TV. I was just like, dude, why do you have to act like that when when Christian Watson dropped that pass? And I said on the stream, the look he gave was, well, there it is. Told you they were going to drop passes. 
But looking back on it, when I watched it back for the second time, I don't think that's what Aaron was doing. And you hear Aaron's comments during the week, too. And this is a lot of people miss this, but on the McAfee show, he actually said, we decided to call that play no matter what as our first play. That was, we're going to give him a shot right out of the gate. We asked him, what route would you like to run? Okay, cool, because we know they're going to be looking to play the run a little bit. And it set up perfect. And now after hearing that and hearing the way Aaron said it and how loose Aaron was, I think that looked at the sideline when he nodded. And he didn't really roll his eyes. He just looked at Matt LaFleur and nodded like, huh? Eh? What are you going to do? Um, I think that nod was, hey, it was worth a shot. Now, right. he could have yeah. done a lot better job. It, 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 he could have smiled and went, hey, man, it worked, you know. Uh, but instead, it's just like you said, that doom and gloom. And and even when he threw that little chip block on, on uh, uh, Zadarius Smith there later in the game, that kind of brung it up a little bit because he was laughing, he was smiling. You could see the offense kind of react to it a little bit, right? I say chip block, but he got his – butt handed to him <laughs> and then staggered around for 30 seconds. <laughs> but um, yeah. it's the same time, man. I don't know. I, Go ahead. Yeah, I think that uh, that the thing about that, that first pass, like all the time, I think that was why it was such, such a heartbreaker is because you could tell that they, they set that up get-go. And, and he put that baby right on the money. And, you know, it just it, – but – a lot of people said, you know, the way that the way that Rogers reacted to that. Oh, oh, Watson now, but you know, he he did the interviews. He's t- talking about how, obviously, talking about Romeo Dobbs, saying, you know, these are good kids. They work hard. They're they're, they're smart kids. You know, the best. They they show up. They do what they're asked. And, and I and I really think that that the opinion going to go back to these guys is is, is false. I, I think that he is going to trust them. It's going to take a little bit of it's more, but but I, I think we have, we have two great players in those guys, and I think Rodgers thinks that too. Yeah, and when you look back on that game, and then we're going to move on to talk a little Packers-Bears here, but when you look back on that game, um, everything that could have went wrong went wrong in that game, and it was still just 23-7. to seven. Like, with everything that went wrong in that game, I would not have been surprised if it was, you know, four touchdown blowout right and the fact that it happened in a game where most people pick the Packers to lose on the road there against Minnesota I think it's a blessing I think it's an absolute blessing because if it had been against a team where it was oh yeah they should definitely handle this team you know you talk about really losing momentum and really get the media idiots chirping you know that's that's going to happen um I think they bounced back this week for sure. But, uh, yeah, Brian, just want to say thank you for that message there in Patreon. Again, that was uh, that was a message from uh, Brian Piahovich, and I uh, really, really appreciate you supporting the show. And, again, if you guys want to support, patreon.com forward slash Clayton Bailey, C-L-A-Y-T-O-N-B-A-I-L-E-Y. Um, yeah, appreciate you sending in the message. So let's do this, man. Before we wrap this big bear up, we got here – we got several minutes here, Justin. No rush. Um, I really appreciate you joining me. And, again, guys – Hopefully the audio is is good enough. Like I said, Justin's on the road today. Really appreciate him taking time out of his day to join us. So hopefully uh, you guys can hear him just fine. But, um, yeah, Packers Bears, man. I kind of did a game planning episode earlier in the week where I did a deep dive into this uh, Matt Eberflus defense and and how I kind of feel like they play and how we should probably attack them. And uh, also, you know, how we should play defense against Justin Fields and and that, that Bears offense, or lack thereof, I should say. But what do you think about this game here going into Lambeau, man? Um, maybe what's, you know, a few keys to the Packers coming away with a with a victory there Sunday night? Well, first and foremost, we just got to uh, keep Fields in the pocket and make him play good at that. Don't don't let him run. Um, don't let him get outside. And, and I think that's the only way keep him in the pocket. It, either uh, bring Rashawn and take him down, or, or be accurate passer. I think I think our defense is set up pretty well to, to shut shut them down. That the fact that it was pouring down rain at Soldier Field last week is even able to to stay in the game with the 49ers. I think nine times out of ten, and I think that was kind of a a lucky outing for the Bears. And you know they're. Their fans are all hyped up. Their players were so good, but yet their their whole team graded out horrible. And I'm out of stock 
in the PFF. I know not everybody does, but in, in my opinion, and they, they see the whole game. Every player on every snap, they watch the tape. They know a lot more than than just the state. They put a lot of stock into what they have to say. Um, I think for for this forward, really, I I think that the health of our offensive line line is gonna is gonna play, play a big um hopefully hopefully we can at least get Jenkins back this week but even if we don't there's really have anything on defense it's that's really all that great that we have to worry about like I said earlier Smith they don't have a Daniel Hunter they have they have mostly young uh Eddie Jackson had a had a pretty good game last week but other than the all pro season anything good since that until that game um i think that i think i think we come out and we take a pretty decisive win and i think that uh like i said earlier i think well pretty big in this game i think i think um i think that um game i actually put a couple bets down on rogers to pass for over 250 and, and i can't remember so i think that i think we wake up this game this is this is a good get right game. It's the home facing a team that we should be able to absolutely destroy. When you look at their roster, I, I think a good game for the Packers. Yeah. And Vegas definitely agrees with you. I think the last I saw it was a nine and a half point spread. Packers were nine and a half point favorites. And, um, you know, one, one good thing, the, the defense that Rogers struggles against in the past um, is two man under, right. And Matt Eberflus's defense last year, I think they said, I mean, it was very, very zone heavy. I'm trying to look at my numbers here. Um, yeah, just a, just zone heavy. I mean, it was very seldom that they ran man coverage. And uh, I think that that sets up for, for Aaron Rodgers to go over that 250 mark that you talked about. I think that that, you know, every, every sign points to that being a pretty solid bet. And I think the key to the Packers winning this game is establishing the run. And if indeed they do that and they run it early and they run it often, that's going to open up so many things in the passing game. Now, Sam Holman and, and Dusty Evely uh, went live the other night, and uh, D- mainly Dusty Evely, but I know Sam was in there commenting as well. But they pointed out the fact that the Bears last week against the San Francisco 49ers really played the play-action pass really well. So I kind of feel like, okay, may- maybe you don't worry so much about running play-action this week. I think you either run the rock or you spread it out. Right. You do. And I, I don't say that as either or I say that in conjunction with each other. That's the two things they should do. Establish the run. But maybe don't don't depend on that play action, opening up those passing windows. But again, Aaron Rodgers against zone defense is one of the best quarterbacks in the history of the game. He struggles against two men under because he's very conservative. He doesn't want to throw into coverage. But you get those tight windows with his arm strength and his accuracy. I think you're going to see a lot of uh, a lot of spot concepts. It may be boring at times, meaning there'll be, uh, you know, a lot of curl routes ran. And it, I guess you could say spacing is the best way to describe that to where the, the way you beat a zone defense, in my opinion, especially if it's not a cover two. And for the most part, this is a, a little more of a, a three deep uh, end result when it comes to zone defense uh, and the way Ibra Flus runs it. But I think the way that you beat a zone defense through the air is those spacing concepts. You've got to overload those zones. If you've got two guys in curl zones on the left side of the field, put three guys over there on a spot play, on a spacing play, to where you've either got you know a drive concept going away from the zone with two underneath options or just run a three-curl combination. And you know, you got two guys in that zone over there because you've got so much help over, over the top and on the shelf, you can really pick that defense apart. And that's exactly what Aaron Rodgers loves to do. You know, as much as you said it there with the Christian Watson pass, Justin, he put that on a dime. Like it was an absolutely perfect pass, right? But he can do that. But what he was so good at last year in the last two years is the majority of his passes were short to intermediate passes. And it's because when you play those zone heavy defenses, he just cuts them apart on those short, you know, those short zone beaters. So I could definitely see that playing a role. But again, any given Sunday, man, you never know, right? And, uh, you know, last year, looking at the Bears' results from last year, they only won six games. One of those six games was against Cincinnati. I mean, Cincinnati went on to – and we I know they looked like hot garbage last week, but 
Cincinnati went on to play in the Super Bowl last year, and the Bears beat them last year. Any given Sunday, anything can happen. You know, the Vegas Raiders. I know that it's a little bit different team this year. They definitely amplified that roster, but last year they were another playoff team, um, you know, after uh, Rich Passaccia, our now special teams coordinator, took over as interim head coach. They went on to make the playoffs. Chicago beat them last year at Vegas, right? I mean, you just never know. Um, I, I'm not saying that the Packers are going to lose this game. I just wish people would curb the enthusiasm a little bit. And because I've heard a lot of people go, oh, my God, they're going to blow them out by 30 points. And I'm going, I don't know, guys. Vegas Vegas got it at nine and a half points. And Vegas is undefeated. They make money every year, just <laughs> so they know what's going on, right? But, uh, yeah, that's kind of how I see it, though. I mean, you got you got to run the ball early and often, make Justin Fields make the mistakes, keep him in the pocket, and, uh, and make him throw the ball to our defenders for sure. And, again, our run defense is weak. That's what PFF says. That's not my opinion. That's what PFF says. If our run defense is weak, then why don't we do a little pre-snap movement and uh, let's get that safety into the box and try to steer Justin away from running the ball, especially on those RPOs. Let's try to sugar him pre-snap and uh, and get him to make some mistakes early because I think I heard the stat. If you win the turnover differential, uh, one to nothing, meaning, you know, you, you had – they turn your opponent turns the ball over one more times than you. Your success rate is sixty five percent. If they turn the ball over two times more than you do, your success rate goes up to eighty three percent. So if you're really keen on that turnover differential, take advantage of the fact that this is a young roster for the Bears and a very 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 inexperienced mobile quarterback who, in my opinion, isn't a good passer. Let them lose that turnover differential battle early, and then you control the middle eight, and we're off to the races. So. Um, I like how we sit. I wouldn't feel comfortable picking the Packers to cover that spread, but I would definitely take the Packers money line in a heartbeat. I think we'd come away with a dub. So is there anything else you want to add to this Chicago Bears talk before we wrap this thing up? Uh, not a whole lot, man. Uh, just kind of that we kind of key in on the run. We, we have arguably the two best running backs in all of football. We have the PFF even said last week that our run ball, Blocking was horrible, yet somehow with almost five yards of carry and Aaron Jones is coming away with 10 yards of carry, those guys need to get smash it up the middle, pound, you know, pound it down their throats, and then even when that happens, we'll like the box a little more to, to sh shut down the run, and that's when we can open it up for Rodgers just to slice and dice. It's going to be a, a good game for us. Uh, like, like you said, may, maybe not comfortable, but, but I think with – with the situation that we're in and, and them coming back, back with something to prove, I think I might actually bet on the spread. Yeah. Hey, you know, I don't think it's silly to do it. I don't. Um, I'm just like, like I've said on multiple times, man, I'm the most conservative gambler you'll ever meet in your life. And it's, it is a hobby for me. I'm not one of those guys that they turn it into a living, you know, and uh, I just play it. I play it pretty conservative. I'm, I'm probably the most boring gambler you've ever made in your life. But uh, with that being said, um, I know this, Indy last year, they ran a four-man front, and we'll wrap it up right here because it, it's kind of what you said there with the, the PFF run-blocking grades and and the running back grades. You know, anytime you've got the run-blocking grade down that much and the yards per carry is up high, typically the running backs have a high grade, and that's what you've seen last week. You know, A.J. Dillon and Aaron Jones had great uh, PFF running grades. And I love the fact that they distinguish between the two. You know, it's one thing to – look at a running back and go, oh, man, he's really dominant. But then you find out it's because he's got this awesome offensive line. And it's another thing to look up and see a running back, you know, with great statistics. But you know, okay, he's the one making things happen. But Indy's defense last week, and I'll leave you with this, because it might, it might play a role into, you know, uh, the rushing yard gambles that you might look into, the, the, the numbers there. Indy had a four-man front. Last year, and I say Indianapolis because Matt Eberflus was the defensive coordinator in Indianapolis. He brings that defense over with him because he brought his secondaries coach. It's not like he went out and got a defensive coordinator from a different system and brought them with him. It, it's obvious that they're going with this 4 3 zone heavy look. Um, but they ran a four man front 93% of the snaps last year, Jacob, in Indianapolis. Or Justin, I'm sorry. 93% of the snaps was a four man front, and they blitzed 20% of the time which means they've got a lot of late movement, okay? That means that they're going to be 
doing post-snap uh, or pre-snap sugar, meaning they'll come out with a four-man front, and by the time the ball is snapped, they're blitzing from that second level. That, to me, spells a lot of success for the outside zone run, which just happens to be the running game that we run. So I want to see a lot of outside zone runs. And with that being said, I think you're going to see Aaron Jones with a, a pretty nice little stat line. I don't know what the yards are at as far as the way Vegas sees it for his over-under on rushing yards. That might be one to look think, into a little bit. I think they're pretty, pretty low. I think they have both him and A.J. Dillon at roughly 45. Mm, man. I, and and you, you never want to take both of them with the over, you know. Um, so you've got to kind of determine, okay, who's going to run the outside zone more. Um, I think that I would probably lean Aaron Jones there. Um, I could be wrong. I, I need to dig into it a little bit more, but I could see me going Aaron Jones over A.J. Dillon. However, I wouldn't be surprised if they both hit it. But um, if if Lazard doesn't play, you're probably going to see Aaron Jones that pre-snap motion moving him out wide a little bit more, you know. But uh, you got to establish that run, too, because along with what I just said, 93% of the snaps is a four-man front, 20% of the snaps they blitz. That puts them at a disadvantage if you can guess which side and run outside. Um, but also uh, – the Chicago Bears' run defense last last week, their PFF run defensive grade was a 28.3. I mean, that's way worse than ours. So I think we're going to be running the ball early and often. Um, again, I think you're 250, over 250 for Aaron Rodgers is a safe bet because it's his own defense, and he will nickel and dime them if they try to load the box like we were talking about. But also might want to look into that over for, uh, for running yards. That's good stuff, man. Um, anything else you want to hit on, bro? No, not not really, man. I just wanted to say uh, after all the work we've done together through the Packernet team, this is the first time I've been on, and I appreciate. It. No, man, dude, you're you're very welcome, man. We appreciate everything you do for us, and uh, again, congratulations with the uh, fantasy podcast there with uh, with Jacob and Tony. Um, it's been a blast, and uh, I'll tell you this, man. I'm looking really forward to to meeting you guys when we get up uh, to Lambeau there in December, dude. It's going to be absolutely rocking we were planning our trip my wife and i because we're going to be up there for a full week and uh, we were you know setting up dinner spots this and that so i know that we're all going to try to get together at the 1919 kitchen and tap on sunday afternoon you know it's obviously a monday night football game for the the packers rams and uh, let's get the whole crew together everybody that makes the trip uh, any fans too i'm going to see if bobby wants to come over uh packer fan bobby you know he's uh um, out there. Uh, he's actually going to be coming on the show live on the post game show this week from Lambeau Field. He's got some uh, corner end zone seats. He's going to be there watching the Packers Bears. So he's going to call in immediately following the game. I'm going to see if he wants to come have dinner with us that day, too. We're going to get a whole crew together and uh, see if we can shut down a corner of 1919 Kitchen and Tap there atop uh, Lambeau Field and have us a good old time. So I'm looking really, really forward to meeting you guys, man. And uh, like I said, thank you for everything you do. Really appreciate your time, man. Man, I, uh, like you said, I can't. I can't wait for that game. Generally, uh, uh, generally, I earlier in the season. I'm a little bit of a wuss when it comes to sitting outside in the cold. But that game, that right before my birthday, and then having you guys there at the same time was kind of the deciding factor. Just so that you know, kind of hang out for the first time. It's going to be a blast. Yeah, I'll tell you what we might try to do too, Justin. I'm in the indoor club seats. We are. Um, what we might want to try to do. I'm going to I'm going to take a look at the security and see if there's any way we can get you guys up inside to, to warm up a little bit during the game. I think we might be able to pull that off. We'll see what we can do. But uh, with that being said, guys, listen, <laughs> I'm a redneck from Tennessee. We break rules. It's just how we roll. I'm sorry. It's just it, it was bred into me. It's how I am. But uh, with that being said, we're going to get you guys out here. Really appreciate everybody taking the time to listen, hang out with us today. Again, want to thank uh, our new Patreon uh, listener, Justin Connor. Really appreciate your support. Um, yeah, so let's go out and get us a dub. We will talk to you guys late tomorrow night, immediately following the Packers-Bears game. Um, everybody uh, talk a little trash to some Bears fans be between now and then. And uh, let's also go out and uh, be the change that we want to see in the world. And as always, go Pack Go.